Right. Okay, uh, so today and Tuesday, we'll be going over forest nutrition fertilizer. Um, and so for those taking intensive silviculture next semester, this is about a third of that class. So uh, this is just a brief intro to it. Um, how many people have already taken soils or in soils now? Okay, most of you. So this will be, um, parts of it will be a review uh, of some things that you've already seen and are familiar with in soils. And so uh, really with fertilizer, there aren't nearly as many societal uh, factors that we often need to consider. You know, if you spray granny's garden next door with herbicide, you've got a problem, but if you fertilize it, you know, maybe not quite as big a problem, right? But um, with fertilizer, we do see it gets into streams um, and particularly phosphorus will then call, cause algae and other heterotrophs to uh, bloom, get very large populations. And uh, that can kill fish and other organisms. And so we've got a whole dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico uh, where the Mississippi River uh, empties a lot of nutrients into the Gulf. Um, but with that, uh, a lot of the problem is caused by agriculture where they're fertilizing you know, every year um, and urban areas where you know, you've got some people with really nice turf fertilizing it like four times a year. And so in forestry in our most intensive we're gonna be fertilizing like once every six years. And then another major difference is we have a deep rooted crop. And so when you look at a lot of the recommendations to keep nutrients out of streams on ag land and in urban areas, the solution is usually plant trees by the streams, right? Well, that, that's what we're doing in forestry. Anyway. So not as many societal factors from forest fertilization. Um, we'll look more at the economic and ecological factors today. And then we'll also uh, go over the breakdown with fertilizer application of how it's split between establishment um, and intermediate fertilizer. And it's really used heavily uh, in both cases, but there's probably more fertilizer mid-rotation than there is at establishment. And with fertilizer, the whole point of it is to grow your stand faster, to grow more volume in the same amount of time, and so there's just absolutely no reason to do fertilizer application in almost any case if you're managing extensively or on a long rotation. It just doesn't really make sense to do. So uh, we see almost all the fertilizer application done on our intensive silviculture systems where we're managing for high productivity on a short rotation. So, so as, as we start uh, looking into fertilizer application, let's start uh, thinking about some of the different soil properties that are gonna be important. So go ahead, split up into groups and see if you can figure out what you think the perfect soil would be for growing cherry bark. So describe the different properties of that soil and why they're important. And then see if you can do the same thing for short leaf pine and see how the answers are similar or different. Okay, so what are you looking for in a cherry bark oak soil like right here? So what was that? Okay, so drainage class. So we're looking for drainage class. You don't want it too poorly drained, um, but uh, so that's gonna be soil moisture. So when we talk about fertilizer application, nutrient limitation, um, we'll see sometimes drainage class links in with that. Um, a lot of our phosphorus deficient sites happen to be poorly drained. Um, so that's gonna be an important factor. And a lot of our nutrients like phosphorus, or sorry, not phosphorus, nitrogen, they're gonna be uptaken uh, based on soil moisture. Uh, so they're passively uptaken, just dissolved into soil moisture. So what, what other properties are gonna be important for cherry bark oak? So the, the texture, yeah, so soil texture. So percent sand, silt, and clay, um, that's gonna be really important for nutrient cycling as well. Uh, we know sands don't really have exchange sites for, for the most part. Uh, to hold nutrients, so we expect a really sandy soil to generally be nutrient poor, right? Um, clays, by contrast, will have a lot of exchange sites on them, so they have a high cation exchange capacity, anion exchange capacity, so that they can hold a lot of nutrients. So we're going to see phosphorus in particular being tightly bound to clay surfaces. What other properties are important? pH. Yeah, pH is going to be a big one. Um, and so we'll look at a graph on how phosphorus availability changes with pH, but we know all our different forest trees have a certain pH range uh, within which they tend to grow best. Anything else? I think we've hit a lot. 
Okay, so how much oxygen there is. And so aeration often ties in really well to drainage class, right? Um, because uh, better drainage, the pores tend to have less water in them. So there's more oxygen available. Of course, that also ties into bulk density and compaction. Um, so that'll play a role as well. What, what balance of the soil is, has pore space, are they micro pores or macro pores? How are those split up? So, so, so again, we're already starting to think about a lot of these different soil properties and that's sort of the, the yeah, so you know you could have aluminum as a naturally occurring element in many soils, but if that aluminum to calcium ratio becomes too high, uh, you can run into aluminum toxicity. And of course, around here we have a, a lot of uh, mine land that has been reclaimed, and so there are some ponds out on some of these reclaimed mines where they have acid pyrite. So pyrite is causing acidity issues in the soil, and there are ponds that literally have a pH of two. Um, <laughs> uh, not many, most of the time they do a really good job reclaiming, but occasionally the land will go back in a little too steep and they'll have that seep and, you know, it's, it's not, they're not just turning that land over to anyone else. The mining company still owns it and they're working to mitigate it and doing lots of different things to mitigate it before it'll be out of bond and sold. But yeah, so th there's all sorts of different factors we can think about related to soils. As we get into fertilizer application, I wanna just think a little bit about what the overall purpose is. And so we've looked at this exact graph before, but the goal is you go out into a stand where maybe your trees are pulpwood sized on average, you put in your first thin and then you fertilize it. And that fertilizer rapidly grows the diameter of the other trees. It increases your mean annual increment and you're able to come back in in four, five, six years and maybe uh, harvest a significantly greater quantity of saw timber uh, than you would have otherwise and recoup that investment. Uh, so you're treating fertilizer very much like an investment, trying to bump trees up into the next larger size class where you get this stair step function in value. And it can also shorten your rotation. Uh, fundamentally, fertilizer on a nutrient poor site will increase your site index. And we know we can manage stands on shorter rotations if the site index is higher, if the mean annual increment is higher. So while it is an investment, we also have to think about risk with any investment, right? So this is a photo I took on a warehouser stand up in Southeast Arkansas. So what do you think might've caused that to happen to those two trees in the middle? So wind is what we kind of expect around here, but they've, they've got other disturbances up there. It could have been wind, but usually you don't see them bent like that with wind, right? they'd be snapped or tipped up. So what other disturbance are you gonna see in Oklahoma and Arkansas? So snow is close, in this case it was ice. Um, but yeah, so that, that stand got ice damage. They'd already fertilized it like two times. Um, and I actually took that photo as the skitter, the skitter's just out of frame. They were fertilizing it again. Um, so they had looked at it, they had some damage due to ice, but not enough that it wasn't, you know, still a good stand worth continuing to manage, so. Um, so even if we get our fertilizer prescriptions just right and we link them into all our other silvicultural practices and we're doing a really good job, it doesn't mean a hurricane can't hit your stand or ice damage or beetles or something like that. Um, so there are some risks. There. The other risk, of course, is you put fertilizer out and you don't get a significant growth response. And that's going to be kind of hard to quantify too, right? Because we know the stand's going to continue growing. So what portion of that growth is due to fertilizer? And, you know, it can be hard to tell operationally. And so fortunately, most of our stands are nutrient limited. And most of the time, fertilizer grows them enough that it's usually worth doing, um, is what many of these companies have figured out. It is industry doing almost all the fertilizer application because they have tools, some of which we'll talk about today, that help them quantify these risks. Uh, consulting foresters and private forest landowners don't have access to those same tools, typically uh, because they're produced by forest industry university cooperatives. And uh, those cooperatives you know, have expensive membership structures because the research they do takes a lot of resources. So the big companies have access to data that consultants and private forest landowners just don't have. And so it's industry primarily doing it. Um, more than 16 million acres in the South as of 2004, we're probably over 20 million acres nowadays. Almost all those applications, 91% were in La Valley pine plantations. The remainder were most likely in slash pine. 
And the reason it's focused on lob, lob ollie responds more to fertilizer than slash does. If you have otherwise equivalent lob ollie and slash pine stands and you fertilize them both and you fix the same nutrient deficiency in both stands, you'll see more volume growth out of lob ollie compared to slash. Um, slash is a little thriftier with the nutrients it uses. Lob ollie is a real nutrient hog. Anything you give it, it'll take. So. Um, 80% of them were on the coastal plain. The other 20% would have been in the Piedmont or further east or our interior mountains, our interior highlands here in the West Gulf. Um, but keep in mind, all of East Texas is classified as coastal plain pretty much. Um, so any application in Texas would qualify. Uh, in the U.S. South, we have fertilized more forest land than the rest of the world combined. Um, and there are a number of good reasons for that. One, we happen to have a native species, lava pine, that we've planted everywhere that grows very well and that responds very well to fertilizer application. Many other places in the world don't have that. We have a good network of roads and we have a good network of small airports throughout our, our region. And so almost all these applications of fertilizer are done by fixed wing aircraft. Um, fertilizer is usually applied dry and so they're able to carry a heavier load than a helicopter would. Drift is less of an issue. And so they tend to be applied that way. We also have access to the fertilizers. There are some parts in the world where it's difficult to get a fertilizer. So um, a lot of the fertilizers are produced around here. So nitrogen is produced through a variety of chemical different processes um, that are very energy intensive. And we know here in Texas, we produce a lot of energy, have a big oil and gas industry. And so we have the, the necessary resources to produce those nitrogen bearing fertilizers like urea. Um, we also uh, have a lot of the other resources. So for example, potassium phosphorus, they're often mined. Uh, Florida has a lot of those mines. And so we have uh, local access to those resources. We also are in a part of the world where we can grow things on a short rotation, which makes economic sense to fertilize. Um, you know, you could fertilize up in Canada in white spruce, but if you're on a 50 or 60 year rotation, it's hard to make the economics work on that to the point that it would make sense to do it. So, okay, so I, I keep telling you, silviculturists like to label things with letters. So I went ahead and labeled the outline this way, um, but uh, we'll split the, the, this topic into two lectures. And so today we'll cover A, B, and C, and then we'll get to the other three points on uh, next Tuesday in class. So we're gonna look at how to nutrient cycle and then how to figure out if your stand is nutrient limited and then just briefly, when should you fertilize? And so when we start looking at how nutrients cycle, well, let's start looking at this study here. This is the Southeast Tree Research and Education site. Uh, so that's abbreviated sea trees. Um, and I took these photos in 2013 out there. And so what they did is the Forest Service spent millions of dollars on this study with other collaborators carried it out over a long time. But what they did is they went out and they found the sandiest site they could possibly find really in North Carolina. So this is kind of like our Tonkawa sands here where it's just 10 feet deep of pure sand before you hit any clay or anything else. So everybody looked at this site and said, this is definitely a water limited site. That was the thought going into this study. Um, so I've taken a photo over here of the control plot. I, I don't know exactly how old the stand would have been at that point, probably like 25 to 30. And in the control plot, you see a lot of open area and you see longleaf pine still growing there. So what they had done when they established this study, they had cut over a longleaf pine stand. A company had planted a lava -like pine plantation and they started this study when that operational plantation was seven years old. And they put in three different types of treatments. They left some areas completely alone. That's where you see longleaf pine is still competitive. And then they had some areas where they irrigated so we can't afford to commercially irrigate stands. It's just too expensive over too long a rotation, but they did it in this research trial where they just put out a sprinkler system, very similar to what you would have in a yard and they added water. Other areas they fertilized, and this was not operational fertilizer where they went on every six to 10 years and put out an operational rate of fertilizer. This was maximum fertilizer. So every year or two, they would analyze the foliage, figure out what nutrients they thought those trees needed and apply all of them at pretty high rates. And so lots of fertilizer. And then they had the final treatment where they irrigated it and applied the fertilizer. And so that's a picture on the far right of the fertilizer plus irrigation plot. 
And you see that is a closed canopy forest with big trees and little mortality. And what you can't see, I was standing on the litter layer there. It was like a foot thick almost. So a really thick litter layer. So look at the leaf area on the right, compare that to the leaf area on the left. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. But here's what they found. So this is the stand height over time out to age 16. And so what you'll see is that bottom one is the control. And then the next one up from that, that's irrigation. So that's the response the stand had to added water. The gray line that's more than twice as high up from the control is the irrigation line, that's fertilizer. So even this deep sandy site that everyone thought would be water limited turned out to be more limited by nutrients than it was limited by water. And then when you irrigated it and fertilized it, that's the top line, that interaction of the two treatments is about additive. If you add up just irrigation and just fertilizer, it kind of gives you both. And so this data really led folks to start thinking about, hey, even the sites we think are water limited are probably nutrient limited. There's an opportunity for fertilizer application. So this was one of the studies that led to widespread fertilizer application uh, being used in our pine plantations in the South. Um, I, I'd be really interested to see what happened if we did this study up at Tonkawa on some of our sandy sites here in East Texas. What they found is they had on average about nine, nine days of extreme drought stress in a given year um, for this study, but this was in North Carolina those nine days often weren't consecutive within a year. You'd have a few days here, then it would rain a few days here. We have much more prolonged droughts out here in the West Gulf. So it'd be interesting to see how this would play out here. We might have more of an irrigation response on a really deep sandy site, so. Okay, so as we think about how nutrients operate in a stand and how a stand is or isn't nutrient limited, uh, this, this graph shows an idea of you cut over a previous forest and then you plant a new pine plantation on it. You grow it out for 24, 25 years. And so what we're seeing on the y-axis here is nitrogen in pounds per acre per year. So if we look at the far left, that red shaded area is the soil supply on the bottom there. Why do you have this huge soil supply of nitrogen early in the rotation? So you don't have big trees uptaking it. Yeah, it could be part of it. Where's it coming from? Dead stuff. What dead stuff? Slash, that's decomposing slash. And so the decomposing slash from the previous rotation will give you this huge pulse of nitrogen. Uh, we talked about with mechanical site prep how it's important to keep the slash well distributed across the site if you can. This is one reason why. And I'm just showing you nitrogen here. This will work a little bit different for phosphorus, potassium and other nutrients. Okay, look at the dotted blue line. That's stand potential demand. So we've already talked about the shape of that curve. What's the shape of that curve? What do we call that? It's gonna be our logistic growth curve. So that's, that's this idea of biological populations where they grow very slowly at first. A little bitty seedling just can only grow so fast, right? It's real small. It can't grow incredibly rapidly. Then they get into a period of exponential growth and then it levels off at the top. Why does it level off? You hit carrying capacity, right? So that's our logistic growth curve. And so what we see is those little trees don't need much in the way of nutrients because they're really small. Does this data suggest that at establishment at age zero or one, you should fertilize with nitrogen? That would be fixing a problem that is not even close to a problem. You have a lot of nitrogen, way more than you need. Why add even more? Okay, we still do fertilize at establishment with nitrogen often. And the reason we do that is that our stands are actually phosphorus limited. Fixing a phosphorus limitation at establishment can make a big difference in growth. You're not gonna have nearly as big a flush of phosphorus early in the rotation. And one of the most common ways we fertilize with phosphorus is with a fertilizer called diammonium phosphate or DAP. And DAP is 20% phosphorus by weight, but it's also 18% nitrogen by weight. So when we fertilize with DAP, we are fertilizing with nitrogen, but it's sort of some free nitrogen along with the phosphorus we're trying to put out. Okay, so the stand grows up and eventually the demand exceeds the available nitrogen. That slash is decomposed. The litter layer from the previous rotation has decomposed 
Our trees are larger. And where that line crosses over, you're seeing it at about age five on this. It's not always five, it could be different ages, uh, but somewhere around there, that's about the time that you get crown closure, okay? So the general guideline for nitrogen fertilizer in our pine plantations is do it after crown closure, because that's when you now have a gap between the dotted blue line and the solid shaded areas. That gap is the opportunity to put in a third shaded area that would be fertilizer. So you would get better growth because you would be fixing that nutrient deficiency. Nitrogen, we're looking at nitrogen here, yes. Okay, you see the green shaded area there above uptake from soil, remobilization. So what that is, by the time you get to crown closure, your stand starts reestablishing a new litter layer. You get into the litter layer a lot in forest soils, right? Where that's a major difference between a forest soil and an agricultural or an urban soil. And so what that is, so our pine trees are dropping one year worth of needles every year. They keep their needles for two growing seasons. So they drop the two year old needles on the ground. And before they do that, before those needles of size, the tree is sucking all the nutrients back out of them, but it can't get them all. Some of them are in there structurally, it can't get all of them. So as that needle falls, it's now building up the litter layer. And that's a pool where it's already uptaken those nutrients from the soil, fixed it into a needle, dropped it. And now the trees can root into the litter layer and absorb that nutrient again. So that's our remobilization pool there as you build the litter layer back up. And so you'll see as the litter layer redevelops, the trees will root into it and get those nutrients. Why do we see more uptake from soil later in the rotation? See how that red shaded area is getting larger? They need more, but they have to get more. It doesn't matter what they need. It matters what they can get, right? Yeah. How are they getting more? So you do have some mortality there. So that, that would go into the remobilization pool, trees dying and falling, but that's a good point. That, that builds up the litter layer as well. Yeah, so would you rather, you know, if I gave you a shovel and said, go dig up the entire tree, would you go to the little pine tree over here, that big cherry bark oak? Yeah, that's going to have a much smaller root system than this huge tree. If we started digging up the root system on this cherry bark oak, we could probably follow some lateral roots out on it 100 or 200 feet um, if we started trying to dig them up. So big trees have larger root systems, and so they have access to more soil volume from which to pull nitrogen. So, so th this sort of dictates when we fertilize with nitrogen and, and why. The other thing we need to keep in mind should be a review from uh, Dr. Kidd's ecology class for y'all. So this is Liebig's law of the minimum. And so can, kind of confusingly in this diagram, it includes both literal water written on that lowest stave there, but it also includes metaphorical water in the barrel there. So um, the metaphorical water here is gonna be growth. And so what Liebig's law simply states is whatever is the most limiting factor dictates growth. And so in this case, you cannot fill that barrel with metaphorical water past the lowest stave. And so if the most limiting factor on your site is water, that lowest stave, then you can't have growth exceed that limitation. And so we can put all the fertilizer we want out on this site, no growth response because water is most limiting and we didn't fix that problem. We didn't raise that stave. Um, so here, if you irrigated this site and brought that water stave up high, you can see you still wouldn't get a huge growth response because the next lowest stave on that barrel is nitrogen. And so now nitrogen has become limiting and without fertilizing, you're still not getting a big growth response. This is a big challenge to forest fertilizer application because trees uptake a lot of different nutrients and it's not always easy to get the full picture on this barrel on a given stand. So it can be difficult. So when we look at the different things that make up a tree, here's a breakdown of the dry mass of a tree with carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen combining for about 96% of the dry mass of the tree. Keep in mind the carbon is all coming from atmospheric CO2. And so trees through photosynthesis are filtering a trace gas out of the atmosphere. They're pulling in a trace gas. Right now CO2 is 0.04% of the atmosphere. And they're using that to build 380 foot tall coastal redwoods in California. So that's where 45% of the tree mass comes from, the carbon. Um, another 45% comes from oxygen. And they're pulling that oxygen from O2 from the atmosphere, 
from the oxygen they split off from carbon dioxide. And they're also getting it from water um, where you actually split water molecules apart during photosynthesis in the oxygen evolving complex. Um, the hydrogen's all coming from water. And so they're you know, again, splitting water in photosynthesis. Um, hydrogen is actually the most abundant element in terms of number of atoms within a tree. Why is it only 6% of the mass? Yeah, it has one proton, one neutron, one electron. It is the lightest element. So while it's the most abundant in terms of number of atoms, each atom doesn't weigh much. Um, so carbon and oxygen are, you know, 12 and 16 times heavier, right? So, okay, so that means 4% of the tree's dry mass is all we're talking about today when we talk about fertilizer. Nitrogen's one and a half percent of the dry mass of a tree. So it's a very minor component, but it's a critically important component. So if you want any biological organism to succeed, it can't just sit there and let chemical reactions occur at their natural pace. It needs to do something to accelerate the rate of those chemical reactions, whether it be photosynthesis, um, different things occurring with growth, respiration. It needs those processes to happen faster so life can function. So it, to do that, it uses enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that mediate chemical reactions. And so those proteins are all nitrogen bearing compounds. So where chemical reactions are occurring in the tree, that's where you find the nitrogen. So it's photosynthesis in the leaves with enzymes like Rubisco, the most abundant enzyme on the planet, which is essential to fixing carbon. So that's going on in the leaves, fine roots, the cambium, that's where we're seeing all the nitrogen occurring in the tree. If you took just a chunk of wood, so many of you all were just at field station a few weekends ago milling that eastern red cedar. If you looked at the nitrogen concentration of your boards, it's probably very low because, you know, that's the xylem you're looking at. That's dead. And so you don't need the nitrogen in there. Nitrogen is also used uh, in molecules that make up DNA. Uh, so it's going to be pretty important in the tree. So potassium, uh, I needed Tyler to bring in his big jug of energy drink today. So, you know, Gatorade, Powerade, they've got electrolytes in them. One of them is potassium. So potassium is doing the same thing in a tree that it does in your energy drink. It's just floating around there as an ion. And so potassium doesn't form complex molecules in trees, but it'll concentrate, for example, in the stomatal guard cells. And how concentrated it is dictates when they open or close which dictates how much water a tree is losing through transpiration and how much carbon dioxide it can intake to photosynthesize. Calcium is really important in the cell walls. Um, they found that acid precipitation in the Northeast leaches calcium out of the soils and spruce trees growing on those sites then become more cold damaged in winter. So they're not getting the cold protection and there's issues with the cell wall. Um, and then when we look at phosphorus, so if you think about all the living cells in a plant, all those living cells have a phospholipid bilayer. And so that lipid bilayer, the lipid is mostly hydrocarbons. It's just all carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But the phosphorus mixed in with that, what it's doing, it's serving as the gateways to help ions move from one side of a cell membrane to the other. And that's a lot of what's going on in photosynthesis. It works like a battery. You move a bunch of ions, you, you expend energy to move a bunch of ions to one side of a membrane. And then if you leave things alone, they will naturally flow back across that membrane and that can re release the energy back to drive another process. And so a lot of that is what's going on in photosynthesis. So that phosphorus is critical um, to making any of these chemical, biochemical reactions work in a plant. And so again, but you know, phosphorus is about 10% of the mass that nitrogen is. So that's kind of rounded there. But if nitrogen was 1.5% in a tree, you'd expect phosphorus to be 0.15%. So. so when we look at the big three nutrients that we're primarily managing through fertilization, it's gonna be nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There are other nutrients on, that weren't even on that last slide that can be limiting and critically important in some forests. Boron, for example, a lot of stands in Florida um, have a boron deficiency and it's a micronutrient. When you fertilize a forest with boron, you might only need to put out one pound per acre and that will dramatically change growth in your stand. So pretty remarkable to figure that out. But, but the other challenge we find with forest fertilizer and understanding how nutrients are limiting in trees 
is that these nutrients all cycle differently. So when we look at nitrogen, for example, where, where is the most nitrogen going to be around trees at any given point in time? Where's most of the nitrogen in this room right now? Maybe. Where's one of the biggest pools of nitrogen on the planet? 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, right? And so nitrogen is literally surrounding the trees at all times. Nitrogen is going into the stomata when they open them into the leaves, but the trees can't do anything with that nitrogen. So N2 gas has a triple covalent bond holding each nitrogen atom together into that N2 molecule. That's a very difficult bond to break. It's a very strong bond. So trees can't break it at all. Occasionally, some species of trees, um, like uh, legumes, will form symbioses with other organisms, bacteria or, or fungi, and they'll give those organisms sugar, and those organisms will expend that sugar to break that very strong triple covalent bond and fix nitrogen so that it then becomes plant available. So. Uh, legumes do that. I can't think of any other examples. Anyone? Yeah, it's a legume. I'm just waiting on Will here. Any other trees that fix nitrogen? Will? Maybe red alder. Yeah, red alder fixes nitrogen out in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Johnson grass. So a handful of plants will fix nitrogen. So, um, and it's not the plants doing it. It's that symbiotic organism. So really the way that plants are getting available nitrogen, it's through organic matter. So, you know, microbes and other organisms decomposing organic matter makes nitrogen available to the plants. It can be as an anion or a cation, and that nitrogen tends to be able to move relatively long distances through soils, and it just dissolves into the soil water, and as the trees are uptaking soil water, passively that nitrogen's coming in and they're getting the nitrogen. So they often don't have to do a lot to get nitrogen. Phosphorus, uh, it, it works with um, organic matter being released by microbial decomposition, uh, but there are also some parent materials that will have phosphorus in them. And so chemical weathering of the soil can release phosphorus in those cases. Uh, potassium is coming mostly from chemical weathering of potassium bearing parent materials. So if the parent material for your particular soil, say you're on a Pleistocene terrace, which is a, a geological series that we'll have in parts of Southeast Texas, um, they're not gonna have much potassium in the parent material. So the soils are potassium deficient. And so that's a, a good opportunity for fertilizer addition. Nitrogen moves readily through the soil. So it tends to have a short live growth response. When you put nitrogen out on a stand, It'll grow better for six to 10 years. And then that nitrogen has all been utilized. And so the growth response tapers off. Phosphorus does not move through forest soils hardly at all. If you have any clay in the soil, phosphorus tightly absorbs to the clay. And because of that, if you fertilize with phosphorus, it will bind to the clay almost immediately. And then gradually over very long periods of time will be released. And so what we tend to see is when you fertilize with phosphorus, you will get a growth response, not only for the rest of that entire rotation, but you'll clear cut that stand, plant a new stand, and that growth response will continue. On severely phosphorus deficient sites, one application of phosphorus fertilizer can convert them from shrubby open woodlands that will never grow saw timber sized trees to excellent saw timber stands. So it's one of the most important treatments we can do on those sites because, you know, it converts it from basically not timberland to timberland. Um, and so if you're, if you're going out and planting a stand on an old ag field, uh, whether it was pasture or row crop and it's been fertilized over the years for agriculture, you probably don't need to put any phosphorus out there. You're probably set for quite a while. So. As we think about how nutrients work in soils, it's also gonna be really critical to think about what the plants can actually access. And so what I wanna look at here is what we call the QCI framework, but it's looking at quantity, capacity, and intensity. And I'll show you this diagram again with some numbers on it, but here's what those three things are. Quantity is the total amount of a nutrient that is present on a site. 
So you may have 2,000 pounds of nitrogen per acre on a site in a forest soil. The problem is the plant can't access most of that. Trees can't get that nitrogen. It's uh, forming, you know, it's already bound up by different soil microbes. It's structurally incorporated into organic matter. It's in a form that's not available to the tree. The capacity now is the rate at which that nutrient is being made available to the tree. So as microbes decompose organic matter, releasing nitrogen, um, the trees may be able to get 30 pounds per acre per year that are made available to that tree. So there may be 2,000 pounds out there, but they can only access 30 of it in a given year. The intensity is the amount available at any particular point in time. So that's the parts per million of nitrogen dissolved into the soil solution. So that's how they're actually going to be taking it up. So here's that example with kilograms per hectare. A kilogram per hectare and a pound per acre are very similar units. Um, so there's the, the numbers I was mentioning. Here's the issue with nitrogen with this. We can very easily get an estimate on that 2,000 kilograms per hectare. You take a soil sample to the soil lab here on campus, they run it through a machine, you've got your number. Easy. We can very easily get that six parts per million number. You, you take a sample of the soil solution, you take it to the soil plant and water lab, they analyze it, you've got that number. The problem is, okay, so it rained a bunch yesterday. So if I go out and I sample the soil solution now, and then I wait, it's not supposed to rain next week. If I go out and I sample a week from now, I'm probably gonna get two different numbers. That number varies all the time. Uh, that number is gonna be maybe higher when it's warm out, lower when it's cool. So temperature and precipitation are really gonna influence that number. Yeah, Greg. Would it be a good idea to take a, a, like a rain gun sample and then a dry sample if you want your soil tested? Well, the idea is that number doesn't really tell you much about tree growth. If you had a way to know what it was over the whole year, you could then integrate that to figure out how much was available over the whole year, but that's, imp we can't possibly do that. It would be very expensive, very labor intensive, and it would still probably give you a number that only weakly correlated to stand growth. So that, that's not a number that helps us, but it's easy to get at any one point in time. It's not easy to get continuously. So unfortunately for nitrogen, the number we need to know is the 30 kilograms per hectare per year. That's the number that tends to correlate pretty well to how our trees are growing. The problem is to do that in the soil lab, you need to do an incubation, either aerobic or anaerobic with or without oxygen. And those procedures will take seven to 11 weeks. Um, and so if the soil lab wanted to start doing that and everyone wanted to do it, they'd have to have just enormous physical space to hang onto these in incubation cores for several months and you have to run leachate through them periodically and analyze it. So it's expensive, labor and time intensive. So no one is operationally assessing that middle number just because it's, it's not practical to do it. It's too expensive. So most of the nitrogen out on a forest soil is not available to the plant. What we care about is the rate at which it's being made plant available, but that's a difficult number to assess for nitrogen. We do have tests, the Malik 3 test that the soil lab can run cheaply and easily. Um, it's the test they'll run when you bring soil in from your yard to see if you want to fertilize your yard or your ag soil or whatever. And it gives us a good indicator of that middle number for the nutrients other than nitrogen. So we are lucky for nutrients other than nitrogen, but with nitrogen, you know, we're just kind of out of luck there. So most of you are in soils or have had soils. So you all remember memorizing the nitrogen cycle for exams. Um, so the nitrogen cycle is really complex. We're not going to get into it in much detail in this class, but you've got different organisms converting nitrogen into all these different molecular forms, some of which are more or less available to trees. And so it, it's a very complex biologically mediated process. And so when we look at where that nitrogen is in our forest soils, this graph shows you four different soil textures. Mollusols on the top left, those are your prairie soils. Um, so that's going to be, you know, where we're growing corn and soybeans in Indiana and Illinois and Iowa. Um, Ultasols on the bottom right, that's a lot of our soils around here in East Texas. Alphasols on the top right, that's a fair number of our soils around here. And then spodosols on the bottom left, uh, you might find those in Maine or, you know, Florida. Uh, but those are the soils where you have the leached out light colored layer, the e-horizon, 
then you have the spodic horizon below that that's dark where all the organic matter has accumulated. And so what this graph is, it's just a profile of a soil pit. And so you have depth on the y-axis going from the soil surface down to 90 centimeters. So it's in 30 centimeter increments, 30 centimeters is about a foot. And so we're looking at a three foot soil profile. And then on the y-axis, it's just showing you how much nitrogen is there. And so what we tend to see in all four soil orders is there's more nitrogen at the surface. You see where all the nitrogen is in that spodic horizon about a foot down on the spodosol. And then you see that nitrogen is much more available in the prairie soil than it is in the alpha sol or alta sol, which are more likely to be forest soils. And so they're, they're not as good in terms of nitrogen availability. If you went out on these soils and you sampled the root system of different trees growing on those soils and you plotted biomass by depth, root biomass by depth, I guarantee you, you're going to get pretty much the exact same graphs. And so the trees are rooting where the organic matter and nitrogen is in a forest soil because they need those nutrients. Organic matter is also going to hold water. So water is probably more available where there's more nitrogen. So um, tree roots are going to be found like when you dig a soil pit in a spodosol, that spodic horizon is loaded up with roots. There are very few in the E horizon above it, but it's loaded up with roots in the spodic horizon. Um, so we can see generally you're going to find more tree roots more shallowly and fewer roots as you go to greater depth. So um, here's, here's a fancy 3D graphic. Uh, you can kind of see the tree root systems connected to the stumps on that graphic. And uh, what this fancy graphic shows you basically is the trees are getting more water from closer to the roots. Uh, but they're also able to get water from relatively far distances away from the roots as it moves through those soils. So trees uptaking water from the soil, kind of think of it as a pump, right? It's pumping water out, that's going to pull more water in. And nitrogen can move a relatively long distance in a soil, so trees have access to a lot of the soil to pull nitrogen in. Phosphorus is kind of a different story, so we already talked about pH being an important soil variable. And so here's the graphic from a typical soil textbook, Brady and Wild, just showing you how pH on the x-axis impacts the availability of phosphorus on the y-axis. So you can see it's at peak availability. Uh, it's, it's the top slice there, relatively available phosphates. It's at peak availability in the mid sixes. So what do they commonly do in agriculture to get the pH of their soils up into the mid sixes? Yeah, you lie, right? We typically can't afford to lime in forestry. I've seen it done in a few places where acid precipitation has been an issue in the Appalachians or the Northeast, uh, just to try and bring really low pHs. Like some of those forest soils may have pHs of like four, upper threes. And you'd, you'd be amazed, they still have decent oak stands growing on them. But uh, people have done that, but it's not really economically viable. Yeah, great. How would you like to reduce the basic mix of you want to make a soil more acidic? Yeah, it's too basic. Typically, you would add sulfuric acid or basically sulfur bearing compounds is how you would do that. So, uh, but we rarely see that done uh, operationally either. So, um, typically, where soil pHs are high, so you're looking at that eight range, pHs are going to be that high as you move west from where we're sitting right now because they get high because there's more calcium and other compounds in the soil, and those chemicals are in the soil because there's less rainfall leaching them out. So where you tend to find your higher pH soils is generally gonna be in areas where water is more limiting than anything else. So you're probably not growing productive forests that you would be manipulating soil properties on. You probably have more open woodlands like we see um, in central Texas, yeah. Now there, there are some cases where you have, you know, limestone valleys in the Appalachians that may have higher pHs like that um, just because of the parent material. But in those areas, usually the higher pH areas are managed agriculturally, not for forests. So, so where do most of our you know, pines and forest trees in the south like to grow? Kind of mid fives. So they tend to grow in a pH range where phosphorus is not the most available. Here's another thing that's important to know about phosphorus. I mentioned that it tightly binds to clays. That means that it will not move at any great distance in the soil. Phosphorus may only move a millimeter. It, it, it's released from a clay surface. It starts moving through the soil within a millimeter, like the width of a hair, boom, it's been reabsorbed to a different surface on a different clay. And so 
Um, on the left, it's basically showing you the idea that you have a lot of non-labile or non-mobile phosphorus in the soil. You have less labile phosphorus or phosphorus that can be moved around in that soil, and then even less of it in the soil solution that the plant has the opportunity to uptake. That picture on the right is showing you a study where they were able to scan the plugs on these little herbaceous plants and the lighter areas in those images are depleted of phosphorus. The darker areas within that root plug has a lot of phosphorus still there. So you can see even in a little root plug in a greenhouse, they can't get most of the phosphorus that's in those plugs. They're only getting the phosphorus that's really, really right up close to the root. And so as we look at phosphorus cycling and what trees do to get phosphorus, here's an extreme zoomed in image of a root on the left there, the rhizosphere, the soil right beside it, and then the bulk soil out there. So if I gave you all shovels and augers and told you go sample soils right out here, how many people do you think I would see right up against one of these cherry bark oaks trying to sample the soil? Nobody, maybe Greg, but I think that would be about it, right? So. When you go out to dig a hole, you're going what, right in the middle of the trees. You don't want to hit roots. That's a hassle. No one wants to do that. But when you sample those soils, you're literally not sampling the soils that that tree is rooting into. You're sampling the bulk soil. You're not sampling the rhizosphere. So what you sample out there may tell you very little about how that tree is interacting with phosphorus in those soils. So the tree does a lot of remarkable things to get phosphorus out of a forest soil. Um, and they all basically involve it trading something that it has in abundance for what it's lacking, phosphorus. So they'll basically exude carbon bearing compounds into the soil, uh, sugars or low molecular weight organic acids. They exude those into the soils. And sometimes what happens is called a ligand exchange reaction. And so that low molecular weight organic acid is absorbed by the clay more preferentially than the phosphorus, which releases the phosphorus from that site and the tree can uptake it. So they're directly swapping carbon for phosphorus. Sometimes they you know, will exude stuff like glucose, basic sugars in there. Well, the microbial community uses that as food and it starts eating, it starts getting happy, it starts reproducing, and it primes the microbial community, which then booms in abundance and starts chewing through soil organic matter, releasing phosphorus, which is then made available to the plant. So that's a rhizosphere priming effect. The other thing that they'll do is they'll give carbon to mycorrhizal symbiotes and they'll get phosphorus back from those symbiotes. So um, it's another carbon for phosphorus swap. And how it does that, again, we looked here, if you don't have roots there, you can't get the phosphorus because it doesn't move. So when you look at loblolly pine, it typically has a rooting density of one centimeter of root per one cubic centimeter of soil. So rooting density of one. So imagine you had you know, a ball of yarn and you put one string right through the middle of this room. That would be the rooting density, okay? So most of the area in this room would be nowhere near that string, that root. With the symbioses with mycorrhiza, the mycorrhiza then send out their very fine hyphae, which are basically their equivalent of roots. That rooting density goes from one centimeter per cubic centimeter to 970. And so now you take that ball of yarn and you string 970 strings across this room, they're gonna be everywhere, right? You're gonna have access to phosphorus throughout the room, throughout that volume of soil, okay? And so it pays off. There's loblolly with abundant mycorrhiza on the left compared to loblolly with normal mycorrhiza on the right. And you see with abundant mycorrhiza, those are much larger seedlings with much bigger leaf area. So they're doing a little bit better. The nurseries will inoculate seedlings with mycorrhiza. But remember, we're planting, planting primarily native species in the south, so there's going to be native mycorrhizal communities in all our soils to form these symbioses. So, you know, when we look at fertilizer, it's complicated because nutrient cycling is complicated. These different nutrients cycle by different mechanisms, and we only really looked at nitrogen and phosphorus just very briefly, but, you know, they're all cycling in different manners. So that makes it challenging to generalize across them. And then the other thing to keep in mind is just because you have a lot of nutrients out in this soil right here, that doesn't mean that tree right there can get it. A lot of it is unavailable to the planet at any given point in time. So given all that, given how all these nutrients cycle, how do we figure out if our stands are nutrient limited? There's five tools that we'll go over. Two of those tools industry has access to. So that's gonna be leaf area index and soil data models. 
Three of those tools are publicly available. So foliar nutrient test, soil tests, and simplified soil models. So if you go and you work for Warehouser or Rayonier, you're gonna have some pretty sophisticated tools to use to tell you if you think a stand will respond to fertilizer or not. If you're out consulting by yourself or just looking at your own property, you don't have nearly the same tools. And so you have a harder time assessing the risk of that fertilizer investment. So let's look at the industry tools. Here's leaf area index. So if I went out and I took one of these cherry bark oak leaves that was live and on the tree, I could look at it and I could figure out, oh, that leaf's about a square foot and over a square foot of ground area, that would be a leaf area index of one. But as we look at these trees, we'll see that there are multiple layers of leaves overlapping one another. So you might have three layers of leaf over a layer of ground. That would be a leaf area index of three. We can do this with pines too. If you look at a fascicle, if you hold a pine needle fascicle right at the base, you'll notice that it's a cylinder. It's round and cross section. So if you have three needles per fascicle, that cylinder is just chopped in thirds. So the cross section of it looks like a peace sign. And so if you take each of those needles, it's simply adding the circumference plus six of the radii times the length of that fascicle. That's the leaf area on a pine fascicle, all sided. So we can figure this out with conifers as well. So what we figured out in our Southern Pines is if you have more leaves, they capture more light. If you capture more light, you produce more wood. And so the y-axis on this graph is volume in cubic feet per acre per year, where you remember 100 cubic feet equals three tons. So we can kind of look at this graph and see it's three, six, nine, 12 tons per acre per year. We already talked about those different levels of MAI, where three tons per acre per year is very low intensive silviculture. That's a very low MAI. Six might be average. Nine and 12 are more of our goals as we up the intensity of our silvicultural management. If we get up to a leaf area index of three, you know, that solid line, we're growing nine tons per acre per year. Leaf area index of one, we're growing three tons per acre per year. So what we figured out is that leaf area index is a great thing that you can estimate that will be pretty valuable at predicting how well your stand is going to grow. Nutrients grow the leaves, then the leaves grow the tree. Okay. Uh, when we look at the dotted lines, however, the dotted lines around that solid line are showing you some variability. So if I look there at leaf area index of three, I could either be growing 200 or 400, depending on whether I'm at the lower or the upper dotted line. So my stand could be growing at six tons per acre per year or 12 tons per acre per year. So if you have two forests and they have the exact same amount of leaves out on each forest, but one of them is growing a truckload of logs every two years and the other is growing a truckload of logs every four years, what's going on? What could be causing that variation? What's that? Not more leaves, because we know they have the same leaves, right? If the leaf area index is the same, they have the same amount of leaves on them, right? They have larger leaves. It doesn't really matter if they have larger leaves, they still have the same overall area of leaf. They have the same ability to capture light. What, what, what could be variable out there? So again, remember the nutrients grow the leaves and the leaves grow the tree. So you would think nutrients would be equally available if they have the same leaf area. Yeah, yeah so what we're going to see is a difference in genetics, right? So the tree that's growing at 12 tons per acre per year has greater growth efficiency. So for each photon it's getting, for each atom of nitrogen it's getting, for each molecule of water that it's getting, it's producing more liquid. So those processes are governed by tons of different biological reactions that are all enzyme mediated. They're controlled by thousands of different genes in a tree. And it's just got a different combination of genes where it can do more with the same amount of resources. So it's more efficient. So when we're, we're breeding trees, you know, we're not intentionally breeding them for better growth efficiency, but that's what we're doing in our progeny tests. We put them out on the same sites with the same resources and the ones that get biggest are probably more efficient on a variety of different metrics. The problem is if I asked you all to go out right here and look at these sweet gums and cherry bark oaks and figure out what the leaf area index on them was, that's not DBH. You can't just eyeball it easily, right? Um, and so there's a few ways you can do it. Uh, the co-op has put together a tool. When you all have used Daubenmeyer cover classes, 
Like, does your vegetation plot have 50% cover or 90% cover? Sometimes they'll put simple little boxes together that have a random mix of black and white squares in them, just to give you a visual idea of what 90% looks like, what 50% looks like. The, the, the co-ops have done that uh, for unthinned pine plantations, where it's just kind of a, a visual guide of what you expect a two and a half leaf area index stand to look like, what you expect a one leaf area index stand to look like. And so you can train foresters that go to work for these companies to just walk out in a stand and eyeball LAI, and that'll give them some indication of whether it needs to be fertilized or not. Here's another tool they use, that's Landsat imagery of East Texas. So Landsat is freely available. Those satellites are flying uh, once every like 16 days. And so you're getting multiple images a year. So even if you have a few cloudy days, you're still gonna get an image. And what they did is uh, they looked at the near infrared to red ratio off Landsat imagery. And they looked at how that correlated the leaf area index that they measured in a bunch of unthinned pine plantations. The R squared was 0.94. 94% of the variability in leaf area index of unthinned pine plantations was explained by this ratio off freely available satellite imagery. So now you can plug the Landsat, some tools the co-op produced that analyze that Landsat data and the polygons of all your different stands into your GIS system and it can spit out information like this, where the light colored squares there or polygons, those are your stands that have a leaf area index 1.3 to 2.3, a lower LAI. And the dark maroon uh, sort of aggy looking stands there, uh, they have a leaf area index greater than 3.3, so a high LAI. So if you're working for this company and you know you can only afford to fertilize maybe 5,000 acres this year, given your budget, which of those stands are candidates for fertilization? You can fertilize the high or the low leaf area index stands. Fertilize the low leaf area index stands. The high leaf area index stands, again, nutrients grow leaves, leaves grow trees. Well, they already have a high LAI. So presumably they don't have a significant nutrient limitation. There's no problem out there that needs to be fixed. Those stands are growing fine. So now you can go hop in the truck, go out to those three or four stands on this example with a low leaf area index and see if there's anything else obviously wrong with them. Oh, LAI is low in this stand because there's a beetle kill. We need to salvage log it. That tells us nothing about fertilizer, right? Or you go out there and you see nothing obviously wrong with the stand. It just has a low leaf area, but nothing else appears to be wrong. That stand is probably a good candidate for fertilizer application. And so this is a tool that can be used well for unthinned stands. But as soon as you thin that stand, if, if I go cut down half my trees, I just cut my leaf area index in half and I need to give it a few years to grow back out. We've already looked at that data with thinning where it takes a few years for those canopies to grow wider and it takes a few years where they're not self-proning those lower limbs and you end up building that leaf area back up. So, so this is one tool that industry has access to the, the public does not. Here's another tool. If you think back to the prescription you did at Field Station for either the FRC property or the Campbell Global property, depending on when you went to Field Station, they had that awesome map packet where you go into your office, you get in the GIS, you look at the stand you're interested in managing, you hit print and out comes a map of all your different soils. And it tells you these soils need 125 pounds per acre of DAP. These soils need 250 pounds per acre of DAP. So it already has the prescription in there for you. So how did they get this? Well, when you look at uh, what the companies did, so when NRCS is out mapping soils and making that information publicly available, they focus heavily on the ag lands and they do sample the forest lands, but they're less intensive with it. So you're gonna get less data. They're also breaking it down for you into soil series. Do you have an agadocious soil series, a Lilbert soil series, a Mantahatchee soil series? Well, as a forester, we know the soil is really important to growing our trees, but we don't care per se what that series is. What we want to know is, should I fertilize this soil? Does this soil have a compaction issue? Uh, what's the drainage class on this soil that's going to tell me what species to plant here? You want to know the properties that impact your forest. So what these companies did is they hired a couple forest soil scientists. One of them lives down off of uh, Sam Rayburn. And they went out and they mapped millions of acres of forest soils, putting in a soil pit every, you know, an auger hole, about every quarter miles on a grid. So just a ton of intensive soil sampling, lots of time, lots of money, lots of effort. You see those codes there, those alphanumeric codes. They came up with these uh, for Campbell Global and basically each letter or number in there 
you know, ties into a specific soil property that's directly relevant to how well these pine plantations are gonna grow on that property. And so now you put all that soil information, you model it, you figure out what works, what doesn't with a ton of these studies that the co-ops have done. So you spend an enormous amount of time and money on research and soil sampling, and now you can walk into your office, hit print, and know whether you fertilize that stand or not. But because they spend all that time and money, you know, this is behind the company's paywall. They're not giving this information out publicly. Um, when they sell the land, they usually sell the soil information along with the land. Um, so that's what makes land already owned by another company maybe more valuable than if you just bought land from, you know, someone, a non-industrial private forest landowner is that it doesn't have that soil information with it that gives you all this good information. Okay, so those were the two tools that the big companies have access to, but that you or I do not. Um, next up are the three tools that everybody's got access to. You can go sample the foliage, and I've put up a table from a publication for you there that'll show you what the critical levels are. So if you sample that foliage and the nitrogen level is less than 1.2%, it suggests fertilizing that stand with nitrogen would lead to a growth response. Now, when you sample, you wanna get, you know, you maybe wanna go out there and do this in June, say, so you want the new foliage that's fully expanded and matured. So you don't necessarily wanna go out in winter and do this. You wanna be doing it, you know, early growing season, but not too early. You also don't want shade leaves. You want sun leaves up on the top because that's where most of the rubisco is gonna be, the most abundant enzyme on the planet, which is involved in photosynthesis. So that's where the nitrogen is gonna be. And so you, you take your branch sampling device out, basically just a shotgun, and you shoot some leaves out of the top third of the crown, take them to the soil plant and water lab, they'll analyze them, they'll give you the report on all the, the nutrient contents, you see which elements are below those critical thresholds and you fertilize. So it's not perfect, but it's uh, an easily accessible tool we have. Um, and then, you know, one issue with it, this, these numbers are based on a correlation. So. I was working on a stand of loblaw pine planted outside its native range in Virginia. We analyzed the foliar nutrient contents and nitrogen was at 1.5%. This suggests that that stand is not necessarily gonna be deficient in nitrogen. We fertilized it anyway, and we got a 25% volume growth response at age six. So um, even though it wasn't below that, it still responded. So, so not a perfect tool, but it's accessible. Soil tests uh, will be another tool that we've got in our arsenal. Go out, sample the soil, just like you would in your yard or in agricultural land, take it to the soil lab. They'll run a test called a Malik 3 on it. And if your phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium levels are below those thresholds, it suggests the sand will probably respond to fertilizer application. You don't see nitrogen on there. Again, we talked about it where it's very difficult to quantify the capacity number, that rate at which nitrogen is becoming plant available. Malik 3 will approximate those for those nutrients, but we don't have it for nitrogen. So this is gonna be a major barrier for landowners not fertilizing more. It's just, you can't get a good number on nitrogen. The final publicly available tool is these uh, simplified regional soil models. So again, we've got thousands of soil series, but what you care about is how your trees are gonna grow. So CRIF is the, co co uh, sorry, Cooperative Research and Forest Fertilization uh, Eric Jokola put this together at University of Florida. And so basically, instead of dealing with thousands of different soil series, lump them all into eight. And we know how these eight different soil types respond to fertilizer application. And in a given region, you can create a list of NRCS soil series that fit into each of these categories. So now you can go on web soil survey, figure out you're on a Lilbert soil series, go look at a publication and say, okay, that's a crib class C. And now you have a recommendation for management in that publication that tells you what's advisable to do. So, so here are pictures of those different soil series where they vary in drainage class, uh, different amount of organic matter, different organic horizons. And if you looked in that publication, you know, for CRIF series A, it's a poorly drained lower coastal plain soil that's severely deficient in phosphorus. That line doesn't quite go into East Texas, but you know, I mean, it, it should. We have some of these CRIF series A soils in Southeast Texas. So these are the stands where if you don't put out phosphorus, you have a scrubby woodland. And if you put out phosphorus, you have a very productive timber stand. So, so we've got our five tools. None of them are perfect. Um, our stands we know are limiting by nitrogen, but we've got to figure out which nutrients are limiting. We've got to figure out what the staves look like on that Liebig's law of the limiting barrel. 
And we can use these various tools and kind of guess, but it really doesn't help us assess that risk. The companies have the sophisticated tools, they can better assess their risk. And so that's why the companies are doing all the fertilizer application. Companies also have economies of scale. If you're gonna fertilize you know, 8,000 acres, you can wait till fertilizer prices drop, buy a whole bunch of fertilizer and stockpile it at one of your facilities. You can probably get a little bit better deal on it because you're buying in bulk. So they've got economies of scale as well that you know private forest landowners just don't have. So, okay, the last thing we'll go over for today is when you should fertilize. And so you want to fertilize when nutrients are limiting, but you need to know how long it takes the stand to respond and how long the duration of that response is going to be. So we've already talked about this a little bit. Nitrogen, six to 10 years, average of eight years. Phosphorus, two rotations, how long that growth response lasts. And we've seen how nitrogen is often available in decomposing slash early in a rotation. So if you think a stand is phosphorus or potassium deficient, fertilize it at establishment. Probably don't need to fertilize with nitrogen establishment unless something has happened with the slash. If you, if you come onto a property and it's been windrowed, maybe you want to fertilize a little bit with nitrogen at establishment, right? But you paid a bunch of money to windrow it and then you paid more for fertilizer instead of just not paying for either would have been the smarter choice. So here's what we've been doing. Uh, fertilizer really kicked off in the early 90s. Um, and you can see starting then way more mid-rotation fertilizer than establishment fertilizer. We've gone over some of the biological reasons why, but there's also a very practical reason why. If you're working for a company that has a million acres of timberland here in East Texas, what percentage of your stands are being clear cut in a given year? So say your average rotation is 25 years. You're only clear cutting 4% of your acreage in a given year. So you can clear cut 4% every year and just do the same thing in a different place year after year after year, if you're managing sustainably. Realistically, it's gonna be less than 4%. So what are your opportunities for establishment fertilizer? Well, if we say establishment is the first two or three years, that means only 10% of your acreage roughly is gonna be in an establishment phase. So if you're fertilizing in a given year, 90% of your stands would be a mid-rotation application if you just fertilize them at random, right? So we have way more opportunity to do mid-rotation treatments versus establishment treatments in general because we have long rotations in forestry. We're not managing an annual crop, so. We'll skip over this one. Okay, so how long is the duration of growth response? This is from a study where they had four treatments, no fertilizer, 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So on the plot on the left, it's showing you height in feet years after fertilizer application. All the fertilizers increase the height in feet. So adding fertilizer increased site index. So on the right, it's showing you basal, excuse me, basal area. And I've put that dark red line on there. That's at 135 square feet per acre of basal area. So the idea there is that's a basal area above which you're thinking, hmm, maybe we need to thin this stand. And so when you look, the, the x-axis is growing seasons after fertilizer application in years. So on the far right is the orange line where we didn't fertilize the control. So it's hitting that threshold to trigger thinning about seven years after they applied fertilizer to the other plots. Where they applied 300 pounds per, of nitrogen per acre, uh, it, it's hitting that red line at about four years after that fertilizer application. So it sped up your next thin by three years. It cut the time in half almost. So that's the advantage of fertilizer application. But the take home message is also treat fertilizer application like you would a thin. You're not gonna go thin a stand and then the next year go out and clear cut it. So you're also not gonna go fertilize a stand and then go out and thin it or clear cut it in the next year or later that year. Because you would have just paid to put a bunch of nitrogen and phosphorus into trees you cut down and take to the mill they haven't had a chance yet to grow more wood for you. So typically you fertilize right after you thin and typically you fertilize at least probably five years before your next thinner harvest. So thin a stand, fertilize it, wait five years, thin it again, fertilize it, clear cut in five years. That would be what you're looking at. Give it time to respond to that nutrient addition. And the final thing we'll look at is when during the year do you fertilize, okay? 
If you're applying diammonium phosphate, it's not as big a deal, but if you're applying urea, which is our other major nitrogen fertilizer, um, urea is what it sounds like. It's a compound in urine, um, but we're producing it synthetically uh, with processes that convert ammonia these days. So no one's out there harvesting cow urine or anything. Sorry, Will, no value for that. But, um, but when you put urea out on a soil, there are naturally occurring soil enzymes that will take that urea fertilizer and bind the nitrogen atoms together into N2 gas, which is then just back in that inaccessible atmospheric pool. So it volatilizes that nitrogen. This happens on the soil surface and this happens at a faster rate, the warmer it is. As soon as you get a little bit of rain that moves that fertilizer into the soil, it's no longer at risk of volatilization. And so what the companies are doing is they're fertilizing uh, in the winter and spring because it's cooler. So volatilization is less. And we tend to get more rain in those seasons around here. So there's less opportunity for volatilization to occur. So you don't see companies fertilizing in the summer or in the fall. It tends to be winter or spring. Companies like Hancock are doing most of their fertilizer application around here in January or February. Um, Warehouser is targeting March to May, and their thinking there is it's still cool, it's still rainy, not as cool, maybe not as rainy, but the trees are starting to actively grow. So hopefully the trees will uptake more of it versus it going, you know, elsewhere in the ecosystem. So, so don't put out urea fertilizer when it's real hot. If you need to apply it when it's hot out, other risks, all fertilizers are salts. So if you put salts out during a period when it's nice and hot and not as much rain, you know, that could drop stress your trees more. We see that in urban forestry a lot, right? Where fertilizer can actually cause some adverse consequences if you do it when it's real hot out. Um, if you put it out when it's real hot and it's not raining for two months, it's not going to get into your trees. It's just going to be sitting there. It needs to dissolve so the trees can uptake it. So January through May seems to be uh, what everyone's doing with fertilizer application. So. So that, that's it for today. So fertilize a few years before your next harvest and do it in the winter, basically.